So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome you to this session on ALP positive non small cell lung cancer. Uh, and we have a very esteemed panel with us over here. And uh, we uh, have 40 minutes to discuss how we would go about treating ALP positive given all the data. Uh, so, just to begin, uh, you know, this is the ALP inhibitor approval timelines. And as you can see, beginning with uh, chrysotinib somewhere around 2011, uh, the last one now is ensartinib, and before that is of course lorlatinib and alectinib and brigatinib come much earlier around 2014. And uh, what is important is uh, this is one of the best uh, some uh, subtype mutation with one of the best survivals, and as you can see. Crisor, this is the French data from the database that after progression on Crisortinib, if they were to use the next generation PKIs, uh, the overall survival is uh, almost touching median over 89.6 months. So, uh, you know, this is how ALP behaves and uh, you can very well understand that it is one of the most well-behaved mutations when treated. Uh, so, now coming to the case study. So this is a 50-year-old Indian woman, non-smoker, uh, left back pain, breathlessness, HRCT showed a left lower lobe uh, mass and a moderate ipsilateral pleural effusion. Uh, the pathology uh, showed a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. Uh, the EGFR is negative, ALK is positive by IHC. PET CT shows a pleural effusion, spinal meds, and of course one thing missing is the brain meds. So there were three brain meds in this patient. And of course the final diagnosis is NSLC ALK positive stage 4. So now coming to our panel, so this is how it sees, is shown on the scans. So uh, let's begin from here. Uh, so what are the key factors you consider when selecting the first line treatment for patients of Advanced and uh, positive so, uh, so, we, so, brain meds is one of the most important factors over here. The other thing is comorbidities of the patient, fitness of the patient, and the affordability that you will know, keep that in mind as well. So, what about uh, anything more you want to add? Or I won't uh, even ask the others that anything more you want to add. Inside of Sorry, can you speak? Side effect profile of the treatment. Yeah. What about the efficacy? Are you uh, also looking at the efficacy of the drugs when you select? So, uh, anybody else wants to add? I think with ALP positive, the most important we are concerned is the brain meds and the response in the brain and the disease progression of the brain. The serious control risk. So that is one important thing. And uh, obviously, the extent of the disease and extracurricular disease as well. So these are the few important things which we... Of course, state 4 would all have extra clinical disease. Yes. But uh, would the tumor burden or something you mean to say have uh, will, uh, actually influence your choice of drug? The brain mess obviously, the, 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 both the tumor burden obviously that also is, the, the prognosis becomes poorer. So that's why it's important to know that. Okay. And uh, yes. Any, any other thing you want to so add? This IHC is an approved way to detect that. Uh, it will be preferable to get an NGS so that we have some insights on the variants also. And then we have multiple options that also may be a factor in choosing the yeah. preferred agent. But uh, tell me now, I want to ask all of you, how many of you get an ALP report with the variant mentioned? Does anyone get it? Like I know uh, that question is there in a uh, subsequent question, but Tell me, anybody is getting an ALP report with the variant mentioned? No, we are not getting, but we have to uh, request them to give. They are, otherwise, they will not give. So anybody from TMH? Do they give the variants? I doubt. Anybody from TMH here? So, um, I think, you know, yes. I think the one thing, we don't get the variants, we don't ask for them also. And the, one of the reasons we don't ask for them is because we don't have any differentiating factors that if you have this variant then you would give this drug or if you have this variant then you... So that is why I think uh, right now, as of now, 
till we have the data, the variant, the selection of treatment, if no variance is not that significant. Yeah. So, uh, yes, more that. Yeah, uh, just to add to what sir said, maybe now onwards we should ask the labs to give us the variants because that will help us in uh, giving, uh, in prognosticating and explaining the patients the uh, expected uh, uh, response, dura duration of response. So maybe year onwards we should have asked to get better and better data on the variants. Yeah. So since you have touched on this variants, which I was going to subsequently touch on, can you tell me like oh, which are the variants and uh, how do they differ in their response to therapy? Anybody can take that question? So, um, because all of you are mentioning variants. Yeah. So, so what, what has uh, been uh, discussed today earlier as well is that the variant 1 and 2 respond better than the variant 3. So now uh, um, in the EML4 health fusion, so uh, the variant 3 subgroup does poorer in both the, in all the studies, the electinib studies, the lorlatinib studies, where the, that subgroup has done poorer. Anybody else wants to add? I think there is some uh, data that lorlatinib may be better than variant 3. So, that's yeah. one so there is data on that. Though it does worse than the others, but a little better than the other. So that is the thing. What about toxicity? Aren't you worried about the toxicity? Don't you? Uh, do you think uh, all PKIs are uh, you know equally non-toxic, or one is more toxic than the other? So, do you think the toxicity matters? Definitely, the toxicity matters here because patient needs to take the drug for maybe two years, three, four, five years or so. That's why the toxicity is available because quality of it really get affected if the toxicities are more. So, lorlatinib definitely has much more toxicity. Every patient will have uh, dyslipidemia, uh, many patients will have neuropathy, edema, a uh, few patients may have aphorism and neurocognitive dysfunction. So, these lorlatinib requires monitoring. We cannot like uh, return the lorlatinib and patient is taking and is not going to follow. Electricity is definitely, uh, definitely dangerous here because it's, it's like uh, mixed, we have highly sinic oxidative therapy. So I have given to uh, four, four or five patients, they are coming three and four months for follow-up and there is no toxicity. So that is why toxicity matters here because the drugs need to be taken for a very long period of time, which, which affects the quality of life. Anyone else wants to add? So with regard to the serious toxicity, you know, if we have got serious metastasis, then we must we have to receive radiotherapy. Then whether to differentiate between radiotherapy induced. Coming to that, I just wanted to know the factors. So that was what. So if you look at this, uh, you know, the EFS and overall survival is important. So uh, that means the efficacy and especially efficacy in the first line. The CNS efficacy you've already mentioned. The safety we have already discussed. Now, uh, resistance pattern, that is also important, uh, especially in sequencing, and we'll be addressing that. So these are all the points we are going to address separately to decide finally on what I am going to choose as the first line therapy in the patient mentioned here. And of course, the post-progression later options which are available. So all these factors you have to take into mind when you want to decide on the treatment. Now, as you know, which treatment would you offer? So, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's begin from the other end. Please go ahead. Can you speak loudly into the mic, please? So if the patient is having 10 minutes, so definitely I need a drug which will give us a good CNS uh, control. So in that case, uh, I would decide on, on that. And if the patient is not in the medicine, then I would choose a drug which will uh, give us a uh, good safety profile and uh, good uh, efficacy also. So treatment definitely defines the first line option here in a positive patient form. Okay. Anybody else wants to say anything? Please go ahead. Yes. You want to say anything? Yes, so, yeah, please go ahead. Yes, ma'am, I agree with that. So, most importantly, is having the brain, so we prefer an agent with the maximum CMS activity. 
Yeah. To address the brain matter, all brain RT I never consider. So it can be between uh, stereotactic uh, radiotherapy or observation. So there were three brain modes, and they were available for stereotactic Now, this new brain so I think uh, I would like to choose between alectinib and lorlatinib and um, coming to the side effect profile I think lorlatinib should come with a psychologist it's very difficult to handle when the patient develops these kind of visual hallucinations, vivid dreams, suicidal tendencies and alectinib also has a very good CNS control rate so if SRS is possible then uh, SRS if the patient is symptomatic otherwise I'll go for alectinib so, uh, in a nutshell, what I think is that Rizotinib is gone. We hardly use Rizotinib these days. Sedatinib is for those patients who cannot afford either Alectinib, Lorlatinib or Brigatinib. So, the first choice lies between Alectinib, Lorlatinib and Brigatinib. Brigatinib is not readily available. So, the choice is between Alectinib and Lorlatinib. Okay. Anyone else wants to make a choice? So, if there are whole brain meds versus two or three, would your choice be her? I mean, well, the previous uh, panelist did allude to that. Should if you had two or three brain meds, you might use stereotactic and electinib. If you had, you know, widespread brain meds, then you go for lorlatinib. So, uh, I mean, some of these, uh, there is no evidence to state that, but these are some of the factors which may come into play when you want to make a decision. So, um, you know, just to show the data, you know, the, uh, these are the PFS data and as you can see, the hazard ratios are excellent in all, uh, of course, very good in alectinib and brigatinib, uh, but what is important is, uh, uh, whereas the crown of, uh, data, uh, you have the PFS data, the median is not reached as yet, uh, it is significantly better, but the overall survival is not mature. So, on the right hand side, what I have shown is the PFS data after 37.8 months of uh, follow up, and you can see that it is 63.5 percent versus uh, you know, uh, the lesser than that. So, the median PFS is not reached uh, in the long term. Whereas, uh, if you look at the Alex, uh, so five year overall survival data, what do you have to say now? So, we begin from this side that uh, what about uh, the PFN data and overall survival data of now you boil down to two drugs, lorlatinib and alectinib. Okay, he mentioned seratinib, he said resortinib, you wouldn't consider. So, uh, what about the PFS and overall survival data of these two drugs? I mean, cost aside, we are not uh, talking about cost at the moment. So, now PFS is definitely better with lorlatinib as compared to alectinib. So, if PFS has to be the deciding factor, uh, like I'm not speaking about the side effect profile just now, but if PFS definitely uh, lorlatinib is better than alectinib and uh, it has not yet reached also. So, it has definitely crossed that of alectinib. So, here uh, on, on PFS, uh, lorlatinib scores are uh, above alectinib. And, uh, yes. so there is no end to end comparison, so we cannot say that PFS is better. In, in the Asian population, data has shown PFS of, of around 41 months with the, with the drug alectinib. So I don't think it is fair to compare uh, across trial and say that uh, lorlatinib is a better PFS. <laughs> One more point here is that uh, so this is all indirect comparison. Uh, looks pretty similar, maybe some difference numerically by indirect comparison. But uh, if you see cost wise also, we have a GLS data which suggests 300 MG PD of electronic is doing also good, uh, showing good efficacy. So if you have a patient which who may not afford lorlatinib, uh, so electronic half hour dose giving the same efficacy. So that that that, that wise many patients may afford electronic 300 MG PD. Who may not afford full dose of electinib or lorlatinib. That's why few patients may be preferred for from this point of view. I don't think that you know, because uh, the Japanese J and X is 300 milligram DD. There was no overall survival. I'm I'm not sure how many of us be comfortable starting at that dose. That's a question. You may reduce it because side effects, but saying that to start a 300 PD 
and even for the patient, that might be a bit uh, difficult. But now, then again, question will arise whether surgery was electricity energy. So, if, if the patient was offering for cold water, the other one so, I think if a patient is not affording for the new drugs, then you have to go back to the old, but you should use the optimal dose. Uh, you know, even if you use a lower dose of the newer ones, uh, uh, you know, it's still expensive. And then you don't have the data that you can just continue a patient on either lower dose of goglactinin without uh, you know patient having any side effects or anything dose modified or electrolyte. So I think this should be the message that if a patient cannot afford the new drugs in their full capacity, then you should go back to the old ones because I showed you that resorting it followed by other TKRs later on also has a good survival. So I think that is important. So uh, I just want to know, like, uh, uh, so do you have anything to say? Uh, so uh, whatever I have experienced, because I think over the data, yes, we have overall survival data with electricity, we shown good overall results. A lot of that we might we will have to wait for a few years to get the overall survival data. But based on my personal experience and what I have seen is that seen as toxicity, I have seen a lot maybe just my luck, but I have seen a lot of toxicity. So if I have to stop the drugs, uh, lot of it completely, the patient not able to tolerate the minimum 25 and they had a lot of lot of CNS adverse events. Even patients who didn't have a brain meds. So uh, based on my personal experience, now I'm going to prefer you know going electronic followed by whatever the next drug will be used. So my preference nowadays is to go for electronic rather than based on my experience using the drug in CNS toxicity. Because in the real world data also, the CNS toxicity is quite high, but has been reported in the drugs. So, you know, you have the PFS data for motor drugs, but overall survival data, which is, you know, five years duration, is with electinib. You don't have uh, the data for norlatinib as yet. So, if you are going to look at both, then uh, and uh, you made a valid point that we look at the hazard ratios, but uh, I would like everyone in the audience to know that you are never, never going to have a trial where you are going to compare lorlatinib with electricity. So uh, you have to tease out the data in each of the trials and then you know look at all the factors that we have discussed so far and take the decision. So, we are not saying that these are comparable trials. They are not comparable, but you will never get a comparative trial between these two drugs. So, this is what it is. So, Alex, electinib is the only one which has the five year overall survival data. As far as serotinib is concerned, it has not been published. Uh, we know about resort in it, but uh, we don't know about. Uh, brigatinib, it was negative for overall survival and lorlatinib, we don't have it as yet because it's still not mature. So this is where we stand as far as overall survival is concerned. Now, uh, second thing is, this is what I wanted to highlight. You can see the J. Alex did not show the overall survival benefit. No doubt the crossover was higher. Uh, this, uh, But uh, important is they use 300 milligram BB and Whereas in the Alex it is 600 mg BB. So that is another point. So now does ethnicity matter? Now here anyone can change the question. Does it matter whether you are an Asian or you come from the West? Uh, is there any differential uh, you know, effect seen? Or is there any data on the differential effect as far as the ethnicity is concerned? Anyone can take this. is I think a good example for this. Uh, because uh, first of all, we, we know that most of the patients, Asian population, do well with all kind of targeted mutation in the lung. GFR patients do much better compared to the Western population. L positive patient has the, another trial that a sensor trial has shown good result in the Asian population per se. So second thing that comes, that's why we differentiate by the ethnicity matters the differential doses which have been used. Because Japan does a lot of pharmacological studies before giving any drug. They don't usually follow blindly the Western data and start with that full dose. That's why any drugs are not approved there and used in lower doses. So yes, ethnicity definitely matters because it alters the pharmacological aspect of the drug. Yeah. Anyone else wants to add? I think my take on this ethnicity, I agree with him. 
But the thing is, the trials do not include Asian patients, means Indians, Pakistani, but I think they are different Asians than the Asians like the Chinese, Japanese, and the Thai. The make, genetic makeup is different. So again, to you know, extrapolate that data to our patients, uh, I think we have to take with a pinch of salt. So, uh, just to show the data on this, that electinib in untreated Asian patients and uh, also in the JNH the study, they showed that there was a very comparable hazard ratios uh, in this, in the Asian patients. Whereas in the crown trial, you can see that uh, what is circled, like the Asian population, the hazard ratio was 0.44 versus 0.28 in the intention to treat. So, I mean, again, they are not comparable, but just to show that electinib, if you used in the right dose, there was no difference uh, as far as ethnicity was concerned. But in the non lactinib, uh, the hazard ratios were definitely better for the intention to treat population, but not so in the Asian. I mean, it did uh, better than the resortinib in the Asian population, but the hazard ratio was. Uh, you know, better with the intention to treat population. So now coming to CNS efficacy and I think we have already, you know, addressed this uh, point. So let's not dwell more on this. Uh, as shown over here, if you look at uh, what is highlighted here, that patients with uh, uh, brain metastasis as baseline, if you look at the hazard ratios, again, we cannot compare the trials, but this is the only data that we look at usually. Uh, if you look at it, then uh, the best hazard ratios you see is with norlactinib. Uh, but bigatinib is not very far behind. And then of course, alectinib also has a uh, you know, good um, hazard ratio in patients with brain legs and baseline. And patients without uh, brain legs, of course, we know. So we have already discussed that. So. I don't think we need to go into that. So this was just to highlight that all have activity, but it just differs. So now we have also mentioned about the variants. So this point was also discussed, and uh, we have uh, you know stated all the points about it. Uh, and we try to find out whether anyone is reporting on the variants, but it looks like all the panelists agree that it's not being reported. So as of today, we are not able to use this factor to decide on which drug we are going to use. Uh, so this is just to show about the variants and that electinib has uh, uh, benefit across all the ALK variants, but definitely it is less. You can see the electinib data on the right hand side. Uh, whereas uh, uh, if you see uh, the V3, it doesn't do that well as the V1 and V2. So now I want to know that yes, many of you uh, did go for electinib, some one or two went for norlatinib. So if you were to look at the efficacy plus safety or you go for efficacy at the cost of safety. So uh, let's begin from that side and see what everyone has to say. Now everyone has to uh, say something on this point. You see, you see why those two, electinib and lolatinib are not that different. They are only, only thing brain, brain meds, uh, lolatinib has slightly better efficacy because electinib also has a good CNS efficacy. So that's why uh, I think if a patient is symptomatic for brain meds, then only in that situation, maybe lolatinib is preferred, but otherwise, efficacy wise and safety wise, definitely the electinib is better than lolatinib. So, yes, each one of you make a point on this. Which one would you choose? Out? So, uh, if only symptomatic brain meds, then all that Otherwise, I Yeah. Yes, being a metastatic disease and uh, its treatment is likely to be long term, both the safety as well as efficacy is important. So, though there is a numerical advantage for prolactinib, uh, it should not be at the cost of toxicity and compromise of uh, quality of life. So with this patient, I, I'll go for adaptinib. And especially if you're planning for radiation, radiation because uh, patients who receive radiation are lesser in the adaptinib trial, it's more in the adaptinib trial. And also the issues related to cognition may be more pronounced if they receive radiation as well as adaptinib. So in this patient, I'll be going for adaptinib. In, in going 
before? I'll let you. Yeah. In case of proposition, we can make use of non-likely. Anyone else? So I think while uh, treating the tumor, we forget that we have to treat the patient first. So I have seen some drastic side effects of norlatinib. I have seen a patient running naked and he is so ashamed that he said that he wanted to die rather than uh, taking this drug again. So I think in terms of efficacy, it is more or less similar in safety. Definitely alectinib is the safest of the two options. So whatever the case, I will go with alectinib in the first line. So anyone wants to differ on this and make a point out of the remaining three panelists? So I think if a patient is on Lord Latinia, we can get away with murder also. So we'll have to explain that, you know, how did the patient... That is true, the, the patient has suicidal tendencies. The patient can murder also someone. So we, can, then we have to explain in court that this drug is responsible or not. Well, uh, it's only 18 to 20 percent, but you are very really aware of. I'm all of my patients. That was uh, 20 percent. I think there were many subclinical changes which were not picked up. So there were mild, mild changes which were not picked up because uh, it was reported 20 percent, but many were not. I think it's also important uh, for us clinicians to identify those changes, which we sometimes we don't do, you know. So because you know, busy clinics and all uh, patients, exactly. So it's sometimes difficult to uh, we we do tend to miss. I think that's an important point as well in the follow. Okay. So you know, just to compare, you know, these are the usual uh, manageable side effects of alectin. No doubt those modifications have to be made, especially when the enzymes go up and, you know, uh, these things happen. So, uh, but you can see, you know, insomnia and psychiatric disorders are very few okay, with this drug and the others are quite manageable. Now, uh, in, uh, on the other hand, lorlatinib, I think we have discussed at length the side effects. So, I don't think anybody in the audience is unaware now of what all side effects can uh, you have to be aware of and of course hypercholesteremia and hyperlipidemia is also important and uh, that is also an important issue apart from the CNS side effects. Now there are certain uh, things uh, to be known about these CNS side effects that CNS toxicity uh, with norlatinib was much higher in the real world than in the trial data. So that is important and second thing is if the patient, and one of you have already brought up this point, has received cranial radiation, especially whole brain radiation, then sometimes it's difficult to distinguish the side effects of this from that of norlatinib. And uh, so uh, you don't know also in the long run, your data is still immature. So how much of, uh, uh, you know, cumulative side effects you are likely to have, we don't know as of this point of time. And other, another important point about the CNS side effects are that even in those patients where, uh, 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 you know, there were patients where you dose reduced because of CNS side effects, as you can see here, you can see in the middle, uh, the uh, second line from the left side, that even after, uh, you know, dose modifications, almost 38% uh, the, the CNS side effects were not resolved. So 38% of those who developed the CNS side effects. So these are important points to remember about this drug. And this was the TMH data of uh, more than 40 patients. So they have used it in later lines, they have found excellent efficacy. But uh, the median PFS they have reported is 9.5 months. And uh, in yes. their side effect profile, maybe because of the shorter duration or some reason, there are no side effects, CNS side effects uh, mentioned in this. So uh, that was the Indian experience. So uh, of course, this uh, you know question has everyone has answered. So I won't revisit it. Uh, now coming to resistance pattern. Uh, so you start with one drug. Say you start with LFT. And some of you who start with non-lateral. So, is there a difference? They progress. Now, when they progress, is there a difference in the resistance pattern 
uh, in these uh, good for patients, you know, uh, in, as in electronic versus non-electronic. Anyone who can take this question? I won't start from either end. Anyone can. So yes, just like any you know, newer generation drug we use, the mm -hmm. mutation panel or mutation which resistance develops are slightly different, which develops with low lot lip. Because many of the mutations which develop with lactal lip are targetable by low lot lip. But some mutations are different, which are not targetable by any of those. Yes, the resistance pattern slightly differs from both the drugs. Yeah. Anyone else wants to add? So just to show you know that uh, uh, you know you get incidence of uh, G12. 0 to R, uh, which is the commonest uh, mutation that you see, but this is uh, targetable with norlatinib. So, if you use the second generation PKIs, then some of the mutations, they are simple mutations and uh, they can be targeted by norlatinib. So, this sequence uh, can happen. On the other hand, if you were to use norlatinib as a first line, and you can see that the resistance to norlatinib is difficult to treat. So most of the time, the bypass tags might appear earlier and are very difficult to address uh, with the norlatinib progression. So this is a difference between the you know first line treatment with these drugs. That what do you use on progression? So with electinib you can sequence, but with norlatinib. At the moment, you would go for chemotherapy. Does anyone have any other thoughts on this? Okay. Any uh, questions from the audience so far? Not we might be good time to do a CGP. So we might pick up any, you know, yeah. patient doesn't have any of you know, these compound mutations, we might pick up some novel resistance mechanism. Hmm. So, uh, is sequencing important? So, you know, it's a comparison between a sprint and a relay. So, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer a sprint or a relay? And I think most of you have already chosen the relay at least. So, does anyone disagree with that assumption that most of you have uh, chosen the relay rather than the sprint? So, uh, what I meant was sprint is you go directly to Lorlatinic, whereas the relay is you begin with one and then give the baking to the next one. <laughs> so, this is just to show what happens, like if you were to use a first generation, then you have the second generation and third generation. But when you start with the second generation, you go to the third generation. But when you start with the third generation, what comes after that, we don't know. And if you look at the overall survival, of course with the third generation, it's not mature. But when you sequence with second generation followed by third generation, the survival uh, is uh, better at the moment, we don't know. So what is important is this data that uh, patients have received up to 11 lines of treatment in health positive disease and uh, this is what happens in the real world. Uh, and what is important is as opposed to some of the other mutations, uh, this is like a forgiving disease. So whatever you might lose out in PFS at the beginning, you can still make up with subsequent lines of therapy. So that is important. Where, you know, in some of the others, the uh, other mutations, you make the point that if you don't use it as first line, you may lose out on patients. But that doesn't wholly apply to alt positive disease. So that's how it's a little different. Um, the second thing is, so these are the NCCM guidelines. And I think um, you know, all of you know that, that all of them which we have mentioned, that means uh, uh, electinib, brigadinib, norlatinib, and seritinib. These are all approved uh, with category one uh, as first line treatment. So, uh, you know, you have to pick and choose and personalize therapy. So, uh, you know, uh, they have brought out all the points on how you would select uh, the patients as far as these drugs are concerned. And then, of course, the ESMO guidelines. And if you look at uh, the MCDS scale, you know, that is also important. It is four for all these drugs. So, you know, they put them on par, but most of them, again, uh, say that you sequence uh, rather than, you know, go for this, uh, what we discussed. So, now I would like to know, I think we have come to the end of it and we have uh, finished in time. 
and this patient was started on electronic and you can see the wonderful response that this patient had and after 32 months with electronic uh, the patient did progress so where what would you use here now yes so when ngs was done yes ngs was done and uh, it had the mutation which is sensitive to non latent so that that is our best option here hmm. but uh, one more situation i can share here my patient uh, one of my patient is a it uh, company uh, worker he took uh, four years selectively he was so happy with that and he was doing his job and there was no issues that he was going regular to his office progress was that and now he is on elect progress uh, one year he is having many issues even severe pain in him he is not able to walk properly he is not he is not able to footwear he has footwear also so he after starting on that his quality of life is much miserable that's why for such patients we want a drug which gives a good quality of life so that patient can live their daily routine life regularly so now for such patient the os is similar at the end so he has received 32 months of electinib the good quality of life now few months of quality uh, with some toxicity he will live the same life uh, so total cumulative life will be the same if the os turns out to be the same later so anyone else wants to share some interesting uh, experiences especially with toxicities and anybody in the audience is free to ask questions to the panelists we have enough time so we finished well within the time frame uh, anybody else yes please go ahead yeah can you use the mic so my question is uh, post electinib failure there is some data of dolatinib uh, versus pem carbo we have some real world evidence we have some uh, randomized trial also and those cohort or basically baseline brain metastasis those show similar effect of in terms of outcome and pfs dolatinib versus pem etc carbo dolatinib post electinib failure i am getting particularly in asian population So my question is in which subgroup we prefer? Uh, if the NGS repeat biopsy is again sensitive mutations with the L with the domain, those who are sensitive for the third generation and second generation L inhibitors, in this subset, which uh, category we have to choose? Pemetrexid uh, carotid versus lalatinib. So he wants to know exactly on progression on electinib. Uh, who, who would choose chemotherapy versus lorlatinib? So, if a patient has sensitive mutation, I will always prefer lorlatinib. So, I will be able to use chemotherapy further. Yes, if a patient doesn't have any mutation other than which was there previously, then my preference would be to use chemotherapy rather than use lorlatinib. Anyone else wants to contribute? Lorlatinib would be the safest bet after electinib. Well, uh, I'd just like to highlight that amongst all the patients and uh, those who are L positive are highly sensitive to chemo. So that is another point you have to remember. Like they are very sensitive to pemetrexate and platinum. So that is also an important point. We had used, uh, you know, when the turnaround time was high, you know, now you can get a IHC report in two to three days, but. previously you know about 4 5 years back it was not so and then you had to arrange for the crisotinib and they had to take a decision so in that period when we are given chemo you know we know that and the literature supports that that they, they are very sensitive to chemo one more interesting case i have i have for the diagnosis in 18 years i know she is on serotonin was then because she is not uploading So she is very uh, complacent with the poor. She takes the drug for four five months. She responds. She then stops. And after four five months, she comes to probation. I restart. She again responds. So almost in a three five uh, three to four year, she has defaulted for around maybe uh, out of four years. Yes, she, uh, she took serotonin for only two and two and a half year. Still she still she responds. So that is very uh, interesting. Just like even if they stop, we restart the response. Anyone else? Uh, 
otherwise they'll do it. Yeah? Mm. So I think the take home message is, you know, that ALK uh, positive disease uh, is a very responsive disease. Uh, you, I showed you all the four drugs have category one, they have the MCBS scale which is similar. So you have to personalize depending after a detailed discussion with the patient. And then of course you have to be very much aware of the side effects. And you should be aware that there are a lot of options for sequencing uh, when you use the earlier generation and then go on to the later generations. So all these are important takeaway points and it is one of the best uh, mutations to treat as far as survival data is concerned, which I have shown you with some of these slides. So I think with this, uh, we come to the end of our panel discussion and thank you.